Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Workday Chat today. I'm Jacqueline Brown, your host for today's session. If you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the comments below. I am excited to be joined by an elite panel of guests. Craig Ritchie, Managing Director and Leader of the African American Employee Resource Group at Accenture. Monica Bowie, Senior Marketing Manager and Global Bold Force President at Salesforce. And Mamta Suri, Senior Manager of Software Development and Global Liaison and Chapter Lead of DOSI, South Asian Friends at Workday Employee Belonging Council. The diversity, land, diversity and inclusion efforts have taken tight, top priority for many of our organizations as COVID-19 caused disruption and created widespread feelings of isolation and social injustices exposed the need for, for systemic change now. The business case for diversity and inclusion is clear. Diversity companies consistently outperform in the market and have higher employee engagement. We wanted to bring this discussion to you today to discuss the tangible ways our organizations can take action and develop a more inclusive workspace. So let's get started with an overview of the current landscape. Craig, I'll start with you. Where's your organization currently in its journey and what trends are you seeing externally as it relates to diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Yeah, th thank you for uh, thank you for that question, Jacqueline. I think there's a, a couple of different things on the journey. I would say it's always it's still a journey. There's still a lot of work to be done. I think we've you know from the leadership of you know Julie Sweet and Ellen Shook, we've definitely not only is it comes from gender, but in Latinx and African American we've taken huge strides to kind of set that agenda within the marketplace and we're getting noted for that. A couple of the, a couple of those things are from a board level, 100% you know, transparency in terms of setting targets. So we're increasing you know, the amount of women within leadership roles, the amount of African-Americans in leadership roles and the amount of Latinx. I think that's something pretty groundbreaking as a whole in terms of you know, setting that agenda, but we're also looking at internally what are the things operational like, you know, mentorship and coaching and, and how do you make putting the, the constructs in place that, that allow people to open up and be their, you know, their, their themselves when they come to work and developing those safe space, safe spaces. So, you know, I think, is there a lot more we can be doing? Obviously, yes, right? I mean, but I think that in terms of charting the, the, the goals or setting the standards, I think we're, we're up there at the top. And, and but a lot more to be done. And I think we're, we're definitely trying to be the leader within that trend from a, from a corporate space. And I'm very excited in terms of what we're doing, even though we have work to do. That's wonderful. Thank you, Craig, for sharing. Mamta, would you like to share with us what Workday is doing? Yes, absolutely. So in Workday, we have different employee belonging councils, also known as employee resource groups. Uh, which focus on the different communities within Workday to make our workmates feel inclusive um, and so that we can innovate. Uh, we have vibe councils at product level where we can uh, make our products more inclusive because Workday does send uh, does set a trajectory in not only within Workday but our you know our system is being used by other companies. So putting that in our products is really, really key so that we can be a good example and also be an industry leader. Um, and uh, having these uh, things in our products make it really easy for other customers to other companies to incorporate this in their culture. Uh, we are also doing the Vibe Accelerator program where we are focusing on our Latinx and Black Americans communities in particular uh, based on the data that we have. Um, and it's a 11 month focused program that uh, it's continuing. So a lot of things are being done, but like Craig said, I completely agree with him. Um, it's a journey, it's, it's never the ending point. It's how much can we do to make sure that we're all being inclusive. We're all being, uh, we have equity in place and um, there will always be gaps. So our 
our idea is to always look at those gaps, identify those gaps and fill those gaps um, so that you know we can all work together uh, to make this um, to make this industry a better and equitable workplace. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Manta. Monica, will you share with us what Salesforce is doing? Yes, and hello everyone. I am honored to be with you all as well. Um, and echoing what my uh, panelists just shared as well, we are still on our journey as well at Salesforce. Um, but some of the things that we've done most recently, um, we just released our annual report to share some of our um, goals towards equality. Equality is one of our four core values at Salesforce. So it's embedded within the DNA of the company, if you will. Um, so we set that charter and um, most recently, like I mentioned in 2020, as a result of all of the news surrounding George Floyd and all the racial injustices that we um, became a little bit more aware of, some of us at least, um, in, the, in the world, um, we started a racial equality and justice task force. And this task force is headed up by four of our key executive leaders. So it's led up by Tony Profit, our chief equality and recruiting officer, for the people pillar. It's also led up by Ebony Freelix, which is our chief philanthropic officer. Um, from a philanthropic standpoint, um, we have someone leading up purchasing um, as well, which is another pillar, Craig Hussey, our chief procurement officer, um, and then Eric Loeb, which is our um, EVP of government affairs, which leads up that last um, pillar, which is the policy pillar. So we're allowing this task force, if you will, to kind of guide some of the new representation goals that we put in place, like doubling representation for black leaders in the company by 2023, as well as um, increasing our black representation and URM representation by 2023. So those two are just a few um, of the goals. Um, you can probably find more at equality.com, which is one of our websites for equality, but it's a journey like everyone else mentioned. We're continuously adding and tweaking as we're getting more data and seeing kind of how we're um, trending for hitting those goals. That's, that's awesome. And, and staying um, and continuing on with that, uh, Monica, why do you think that diversity and inclusion is important in the workplace? Yeah, so with, without sitting here and taking over the whole hour or time that we're be, we'll be together, it is important for a number of reasons. Number one, innovation is key, right? In most of our companies and in, in the space that we work in is technology. And so creating things that are going to serve the workforce or serve the societies that we live in, we need a, a workforce that looks like the society. That's, I think, key. You really can't serve anything unless you reflect what you're serving. Um, and so our goal is to reflect the societies that we serve in most of our organizations. I know that value is probably key. Um, and so by doing that, you bring more voices to the table. It's the right thing to do, right? You don't want to just have a monolithic culture, even within your own circles. So you need new ideas, you need diverse voices, you need um, people in higher places um, to make decisions and key decisions that will serve those communities. And so for a number of reasons, but a um, couple that come to mind for me are obviously um, helping out with innovation and serving the society and reflecting the societies that we serve. Right. Uh, Monta, would you like to add anything to that? Why do you think diversity and inclusion is important in, your, in the workplace? Yeah, um, definitely echoing what Monica has said, but also, um, you know, data has shown us that companies who have diverse workforce is 20 to 30 percent more profitable. It increases our revenue. And if you look at why that is, some of the reasons that Monica has mentioned, it increases innovation. When you have diversity of thoughts come in, um, you can be more creative. You can look at problems differently. If we all are thinking the same way, uh, we're always going to get at the same solutions. So it's important for uh, when I think of diversity, I think of diversity of thought. Um, and that's very important because all of us, uh, based on our different diverse experiences, backgrounds, um, you know, the, not just the uh, uh, ethnic and uh, uh, racial backgrounds, but also um, the city, the town, the high school we went to, all of us, those experiences shape us. They, uh, they become an identity for us. And it's because of that, 
you know, we are able to contribute. Uh, we are able to look at problems and think about it differently. We are able to uh, comprehend them and come up with solutions. And it's that synergy, it's that uh, collaborativeness within the team um, where we can actually make those innovations, we can move things quicker, and we can really, um, you know, add a lot more um, to this world, um, you know, for our children as well. So diversity is definitely, definitely very important. It's, uh, uh, if anything, you know, this COVID-19 has shown us uh, how we can be agile, right? We're all, a lot of us are working from home. A um, lot of our, uh, you know, heroes are out there uh, tackling this. Our, you know, healthcare workforce is tackling this head on and we're all in this together. So that's why we need those different experiences. We need those different perspectives um, in this world. Yes, absolutely. And it's so key to employee engagement and employee retention. Um, and being feeling inclusive or feeling like you, that you have that inclusivity is really, really powerful um, from an employee retention standpoint. And so it really becomes an important element of what companies need to focus on. I'm sure that uh, in the course of, of your businesses today, all of you are right now part of employee resource groups or employee belonging councils. How have the employee belonging councils really shaped organizations throughout this, this um, diversity and inclusion timeframe? Well, Frank, I'll, let's start I'll, with you. I'll, yeah, I'll, t I'll tackle that one. I mean, I think they've been immensely, they've made a huge impact in terms of shaping, shaping our organization. Because when you look at, you know, kind of going back to the, the last question a little bit is that number one, we have to reflect what our clients look like. And then I think the employee resources groups are a huge component in terms of from a recruiting, from a retention and, and getting the right skills and capabilities within the door, but also getting them to, to serve, our, serve our clients. And then and obviously I see that as my role as the executive sponsor for the African-American ERG, but in my other head, I actually run the, full, the whole Midwest strategy and consulting business. And what we've seen is we've started to integrate you know, the ideas, the thoughts, and I call it getting the community together within the, the business. We see that when we bring these teams together, and like they said before, the diversity of thought, we make such a huge impact on our clients and actually deliver way better. Because it, you're just bringing all these ideas and capabilities. And the reality is, it's not, you would need diverse folks to be part of that conversation to, to make that impact, not only internally, but for our clients. And then last piece, I think obviously at Accenture, being a part of the fabric of our community is very important as well. So because there gets to comments around you know, economic equality. So I think the ERGs are the leader in terms of standing up and providing those points of views. And at times sharing things that from a different lens that if we didn't have those in place, that lens wouldn't be provided. So just making a huge over impact overall. Monica, if you would like to share your thoughts on how employee resource groups are um, impacting the organization. Yes, sure. Um, so I will share from the perspective, I am currently global president of Bold Force, which is our black ERG employee resource group. We call them equality groups at Salesforce. Um, I would say kind of echoing what Craig said, it is a key thread in the culture of Salesforce um, in the culture of really any company. Um, and it shapes, it really helps belonging from the standpoint of building community. So oftentimes when you're a part of a group that is underrepresented, such as the black communities at most of our tech companies, you do find that sometimes it's hard to fit in or find commonalities or just really have a place to go and just find that community so that you feel included and valued. And those employee resource groups provide that value until I think the culture catches, catches up, if you will, or mm -hmm. until the employee makeup will catch up. And so what I can say Bolt Force has done for me personally, as well as the organization is we've held a number of community discussions where we have executives present and involved and active. We have executive sponsors like Craig mentioned um, that come on board and they're actually very um, active in helping us get our voices heard on the things that are important to our communities that we need to see 
for instance, increasing the representation goals was one that both was mm -hmm. echoed and that the leadership team responded to. Um, both force was also very instrumental in helping the racial equality and justice task force um, get kicked off as well as helping kind of become a feedback channel, if you will, for how we um, move and, and how we shape our culture moving forward. Um, we've seen councils pop up from some of the other employee resource groups like Ability Force, where you know, we, we now have a channel for accessibility and making sure that our technology is accessible to everyone. So they serve a really key um, point of value for not only the culture and the community and, and, and belonging for your employees, but if you have a technology or, or software or products that you put out in the world, those employee resource groups can actually help shape those products to be better served for your clients, which I think is also very key. Awesome, that's wonderful. And then uh, Manta, you are a founder of the EBC at Workday. Can, would you provide some advice to other companies or employees that are looking to start a resource group or employee belonging council? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we already talked about why ERGs are important, right? Mm -hmm. um, another point I would just like to add is that you know when we 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 use the word diversity and inclusion a lot of the times uh, interchangeably. But diversity is when we focus on certain efforts to make sure that diverse employees are coming in the door. But inclusivity is making sure they're still comfortable, right? They can still able to sit at the table and they can um, provide their ideas without uh, feeling hesitation. They have the trust in the organization. So ERGs does help foster that. So if a company does not have ERGs or specific ERGs and they want to start out, it's important to look at the reasons why ERGs are important. How do they add business value? How do they um, add to the business revenue at the end of the day as well? So, you know, it's uh, there are many different resources out there. You can start um, even, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Salesforce, um, I love that word, Actable, um, you know, uh, and uh, Accenture, they all have done great jobs. So for uh, companies who want to start ERGs, um, look for those people who want to lead uh, these are ERGs who are passionate about this work. And uh, when I started there, uh, we were just starting out the journey in Workday. Uh, we, you know, uh, what are ERGs? We had to understand how do we add value? How are they different from culture, cultural clubs? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we make that inclusivity environment for our, uh, for our workmates, for that community? So looking at where the need is, um, connecting the dots, and also this is a good opportunity to uh, have those uh, leaders lead it and have those leadership, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the in, you know, the stretch opportunities, if you will, to enable them, um, empower them to uh, gain these leadership skills. Um, and one important part is that ERGs by themselves uh, can only do so much. So you also need executive sponsors. Mm -hmm. So you need, uh, you know, people in executive roles within your company to be able to sponsor this ERG, who can be a voice for you at the table, who can uh, make sure that the, the charter that you have, the things that you wish to accomplish within this year, uh, you have budget for, you have bandwidth for, and um, you're getting recognized for. So, uh, you know, that's where, um, uh, I would say that look for the people within your com uh, company who are passionate to do this work, develop those people, um, start these ERGs, and then enable them and empower them with executive leadership within the company um, so that, you know, together they can able to do this meaningful work. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's wonderful. And one of the things that um, you, you've all talked about is how the er ERGs are really helping to to be that voice for the community back to the organizational leaders. Um, can any one of you talk about accountability of those leaders to the, the ERG? What can they be doing to ensure that not only are they supporting the ERGs, but they're really listening to them and enacting different processes or policies or 
actions to really support some of the things that they're hearing from the communities? Yeah, I, I, can, I can start with that one a little bit. I, I think from my, my role as an executive sponsor, it's, I think there's a couple of keys. It's, it's number one, there's different views in the ERG across, you know, people have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think one, one part of my, the role that I think becomes very important is how do you kind of listen? And, you know, I have a panel of advisors that I kind of listen to and think through then how do I kind of communicate that back to the broader leadership community, especially people that don't look like, you know, the African-American ERG. So I think that's a critical component. Don't underestimate the, the challenge associated with that because people definitely have different views within the group. And so, mm -hmm. so how do you, you present that appropriately? The other thing is it comes down to funding, right? You need to have funding to support the ERG. So how do we make sure that you're continually elevating and getting the agenda always at the top of the house and making sure that you have that sponsorship. And that changes year to year when you go through that, but funding and also making sure that translating that point of view becomes very important to continually to scale or grow the ERG. Excellent. Any other thoughts, Monica? Say, um, in terms of the accountability point that you made, mm -hmm. find a structure that works for your organization. Every company is gonna be slightly different depending on the size and and really the way you guys are set up, but find something that is both external and internally holding you guys accountable. Um, so as a result of some of the work of the ERGs, but really because we're so close in partnership with our executive leadership team, as well as our sponsors, we've developed a number of things. And one of them is a, a monthly scorecard, if you will, that, ma that helps ma uh, managers that are VP level and above monitor their improvement against representation goals. And they get that information. Now, I don't get to see it. I'm not a VP yet, but. <laughs> you will be. You will be. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That data to say, okay, here's where I've made the needle move in terms of how many women I've hired, how many um, Black um, employees have I hired, how many Latinx employees, underrepresented groups, right? Mm -hmm. So you get to see internally, and this is not obviously anything we share externally, but internally we have these scorecards that those leaders get. And then externally, we do share our annual numbers so that even if they don't look as favorable as we'd like them today, we do get to see where we're trending and where we need to make room and improvement. And so being transparent, holds yourself accountable no matter where the numbers are, even if they aren't ideal yet, holding, holding yourself accountable by being transparent is also key. Excellent. Um, one of the things, I'm, I'm a member of an EBC and also co-lead of the in, uh, Black at Work Day EBC. And one of the things that we have been challenged with is how do the employee resource groups balance allyship with providing or maintaining that safe space for the community members? What thoughts do you have? What would you like to share about the EBCs that you've worked with and how are they handling that particular challenge? Um, I'll start with you, Monica. Yeah. So we have had a number of safe spaces, if you will, where we do hold these circles and calls and, and opportunities for members of the community to get together to have that safe space. Um, ideally, we do, you do think there is a need to have those communities have a space just for them, but we do have, um, you know, a policy where everyone is open and available to join. So even if you're not a member of that community, you can join those safe spaces and in some instances to you know, potentially hear and get feedback, but we do ask our allies, if you're not a member of the community of the safe space that you're joining, that you remain kind of as a listener, an active listener, and let that space be held for the members of that community who probably needed the most at, the, at that time. So that's one way. Um, and we do encourage allyship across all of our groups. Um, our membership grew quite significantly in 2020. I think we went from 3,000 to 7,000 members with Bold Four. So mm -hmm overwhelmed by obviously more than just members of the black community, but really grateful that we have the allies um, showing up to, to get involved. Yes, we experienced the same thing at Workday with our Black at, black at Workday um, Employee Belonging Council. Mamta, would you like to add anything to how, how are you and your leaders of your ERG balancing allyship with providing that safe space? I think allyship is really, really important because um, one thing is we have seen in these ERGs is the intersectionality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, one, you know, 
one person could be like, for example, I am a person of color, a woman, um, and uh, a, a parent, a caregiver. So uh, there are different there are different roles that each of us have. Mm -hmm. So when you have allyship, and you, ha I mean, it's important to have space spaces for your members as well. But the allyship actually um, gives you that uh, platform to become um, more aware of other uh, other ERGs. Uh, listen to their viewpoints. It makes you actually more diverse in your thought. Um, and I actually attend other ERGs, uh, you know, different events they have. Uh, and I am from the Asian ERG. So culture is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our events are open to all of our workmates. And it really gives us um, an opportunity to share our culture, to share our cultural differences as well uh, with our workmates. What are the different festivals we have? Uh, you know, what are the different um, ways we celebrate different things? And it gives an opportunity to break some of the stereotypes as well. So I really like allyship, and I actually, you know, um, even am a speaker at. Uh, you know, for example, Lesbians Who Check um, and other um, conferences as well as internally because it broadens my perspective. It gives me more viewpoints and it makes me a better person um, and a better leader. Excellent, great. And that's a great segue into Craig, uh, the, the next question. How can we foster that environment of authenticity, respect, and trust amidst all the differences that um, we have? No, no, great, great question. No simple answer to that question. <laughs> I'll build off of the, the last conversation around, you know, allies and, and safe space, which are extremely important. We definitely need to have safe spaces. You know, we definitely need allyship, but when you really get into this conversation, I think I call it transparency mm -hmm. and open communication is critical. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge with both of those things is, both of those concepts is, you're gonna hear some things you don't like, right? you're, you're, you know, when you're going through that open conversation or with transparency in the numbers, you know, you'll see some pockets of good and some pockets of bad. So I think with one of the things that you know, you know, Julie, our C, Julie Sweet, our CEO, and Ellen Shook is our CHRO, is they really took the, I would say, a leadership role in terms of, hey, we have to be trans, transparent from the board level, so the board's going to see how well we we're doing, and that's part of our board report. Mm -hmm. It's also been built at, that we, we have um, within our scorecards that my leadership team across all my dimensions will look at that to see how well we're doing about that. It's created this new environment that that it creates another different conversation, which is critical. And then the second piece that I think the it, again safe spaces are important, but the listening becomes very important because when when the tragic events of George Floyd, which I I don't want to just say George Floyd because we can we can go on and on and and the number of events mm -hmm. we opened up a. You know the buzz is the buzz starts to happen in the ERG, and so then we we open up a space where just to have no agenda and have people to start to tell how they feel. Mm -hmm. That line obviously started off. It started off as African American, right? It went to every office managing director across North America, every ERG, and to the point where we had thousands of people on a line sharing with emotion and, and just raw the, the, the feelings. And I feel like that was a, a, to the point where we had to do it more because we, the, the line broke. You couldn't have more people added to, to the line. And we had, you know, you know, Julie listening, heard about it, you know, the office managing partners, our CRTRO, just hearing it. And what, while that was a very challenging event because you hear things allies would hear things and some people who weren't allies would hear things wow I didn't even think about that and what that transparency did it really opened up another lens in terms of where I thought we had a pretty amazing I would say uh, I'm gonna call it IND game in terms of what we were doing 
it just took it, that transparency took it up to, a, a, in, in that conversation, took it up to a different level. So all I'd say is, and you know, when you look at those difficult conversations and in some of the challenging stuff that you may hear, I think that transparency, open communication, and putting on the top, on the table is very critical to accelerate the goal. And, and I think that's why one of the things, if you look at our branding, you know, let there be change, right? And I think that let there be change means you have to listen on all sides and all different perspectives. So that's one thing I would say is that we have to, my advice to other companies, we need to, to really open that listening. And I think also from an ERG standpoint, we need to share amongst ourselves better as well. So that's one of the things I put in on our list. How do we have more conversations, you know, with a sales force or with a work day and share those common experiences learning? Because I think we can all learn from each other, which will even take us to a different level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and the, the, the whole idea of connecting across company is, can, is, can be very, very powerful. And just like the conversation that we are having here today, we learn a lot from each other, things that we can piggyback off of or you know, even adopt in our own organizations that can help us be more powerful as EBCs and as organizations, as organizations that we support. So 2020 is now done. We're in January. <laughs> so can you talk about, um, and, um, and Monica, let's start with you. Talk about what are some of the specific goals and missions and strategies that your employee resource group has for 2021? So um, our, for one, our global elected, our global positions for ERGs are elected. And so we just had a, our own election, if you will, at Salesforce, where we will be bringing in new global leaders starting in February. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of the goals will be supporting those new leaders, we'll build out things that we learned from our, our previous leadership group, which is have committees so that people can get involved when they can and maybe they can't hold a, a position the entire time. Our global positions are at two years at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and because it is a job that can become very overwhelming in addition to your day job, which is always priority. <laughs> day job is always priority. It's the thing that gives you access to the ERGs. Yes. We'll always prioritize that. But I think I'm proud to see the new leadership that's coming on board um, to get involved and have more support with committees, with our executives, um, potentially with more ways to get involved in the community. Um, and then I mentioned earlier the Raci Racial Equality and Justice Task Force, which is very embedded within our equality groups. So we're looking forward to helping to increase those goals as well. As we hit them, we want to continue to set them higher to hit more. Excellent. Mamta, what kind of goals have your EBC set for 2021? Um, first of all, is 2020 really over? <laughs> <laughs> that's real that's a good question <laughs> it, is, it seems like 2021 is competing for limelight so far <laughs> oh i like that uh, so it's it's definitely been a very challenging year right in different respects and uh, we have learned from it a lot um it's it's been a learning experience so within our EBCs, you know, our focus is going to be making sure that our communities are feeling inclusive, um, they have that level of trust, we are able to focus on the career development and um, talent retention. Um, it, it's difficult, right? And I talked about the intersectionality initiatives, and you have all seen the reports where uh, women have been losing more jobs during this pandemic um, than men. Uh, they've been, um, you know, there's the, the stats are, are pretty, uh, pretty uh, depressing. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's our job to learn from these, um, these hard times and make sure that we can continue to provide an environment where our workmates feel safe, um, they feel inclusive, we are able to do our day job, as Monica said, it's very, very important. And uh, uh, among other ERGs in Workday, we have other initiatives as well going on. Like I mentioned about the uh, Vibe Accelerator program, um, you will be hearing a lot more about that. Um, and we also have the Vibe Index that we have launched where, um, you know, it will be like kind of like the heartline 
on where the different companies are and uh, Workday is using it um, ourselves. So we'll be able to see how our initiatives um, are making a difference, where we need to focus on, where we need to synergize with other um, ERGs, how we can all collaborate and work together. Um, like Craig mentioned, we can learn a lot from each other. Uh, I also feel internally, you know, we can work on our intersectionality initiatives a lot more closer. And it's a journey, right? It's, it's never ending work. So it's uh, like we do with our um, with our scrum teams, right? We we retrospect, we learn from that, and then we try to improve. So it's an ever continuous uh, improving um, journey that uh, you know we all need to uh, focus on uh, within Workday, and I you know I recommend it to other companies as well. Mm, yes, that's that's great. And as we think about, we get into twenty twenty one, and at some point, twenty twenty will become the year of historical events, but thinking about those historical events and how a lot of those events from last year shaped where we are today, one of the things or one of the questions that I consistently have asked in, in conversations we have within our EDC is how do we keep momentum going, both within the group, within the EDC itself, as well as the broader organizations? What thoughts or ideas do you have around how do we keep momentum going, Craig? Yeah, I think it's, as, as Monica said the, before, we have our day jobs and then we have this as well. So sometimes it's hard to, to kind of keep that momentum. I, I, I come at it from my business angle. With, with success breeds involvement. So I think the more that we can you know, as I say, for, for our ERG, it's rising to the occasion. I mean, we have ambitious goals that have been set. We've met those goals, gender, you know, we had a goal for, you know, gender goals prior. We, we met that goal before the time frame that we were supposed to meet that goal. Mm -hmm. I want to do that the same thing for Latinx and African American. So the only way to do that is really embed within the fabric of your company and really drive the success in terms of recruitment, promotions, you know, in, in our business, you know, it's all about your relationships. So making sure that when you see opportunities for someone linking people with those opportunities. And for me, when I've seen when we've done that well, we get that momentum and that involvement, right? I think we have a great framework, but we have to execute in, in, in our ERG rise to the occasion mm -hmm. and success breeds success mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And so, and that's by people growing getting to the next level, recruiting more talented people and so forth. So when we do that well, I think it, it, it keeps that momentum uh, at a high level. Great. Monica, anything you would like to add? Yeah, um, I would love to maybe a couple of points. Number one, for momentum, I would ask executives, especially ELT members that are reports of the CEO, the direct reports of the CEO, the highest level possible, if you will, um, be proactive in getting involved in an ERG. Don't wait for a George Floyd moment or something to go chaotic. Mm -hmm. Find something mm -hmm. to do, even if it's just one program that you're going to sponsor with budget, your mm -hmm. time and budget. Um, sometimes we want to do these big ideas, but we don't have budget to support it. So mm -hmm. be proactive, ask where you can get involved and don't just get involved with groups that are your affinity. Be okay mm -hmm. with getting you know, if you're a white male or a woman, be involved in any group that you might be the most curious about or that actually has the most need or help needs the most help. Um, that's one. And then because I am a black woman, I would say keeping the momentum going, make sure black women that you take care of yourself, be mm -hmm. gentle to yourself and each other. A lot of times, and I particularly can speak to this, found myself overwhelmed and maybe needing a, a couple of breaks to take PTO. <laughs> as how you can help others that are in leadership roles um, and be kind to yourself and gentle to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. Mamta, anything you would like to add on keeping the momentum going? Yeah, um, I think one additional point I would like to add is that, you know, um, 2020, um, for better or for worse, has shown us, you know, the systemic challenges that we have. It has brought to the for, uh, forefront uh, these issues that we didn't used to talk about before, uh, and you know, lot many um, 
across the, you know, the different companies workforce, they're now having a dialogue about this. So uh, it's really important that we keep this momentum going, like Monica said, like, don't wait for that, you know, um, that pivotal moment, but continue to do this work. So it's up to us, um, each of us, to make sure that, you know, uh, to continue to having those dialogues, to better understand each other's viewpoints, read, read different articles, right? Read different viewpoints, um, watch different shows, uh, there is a lot of good programming on Netflix that's, you know, um, is focused on um, Black history. Uh, there are a lot, pro lot many programs are coming up. Um, there is also, uh, not very well known, but there has also been Asian backlash, uh, you know, with this whole COVID mm -hmm. vaccine and then the stereotypes and biases mm -hmm. that have come through. So just listening to different viewpoints, keeping your mind open, uh, whether you are in an ERG or not, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Because we are, uh, we are a person in this country and in the society. So ERGs, we can do you know, um, a lot of good work within the company, but also as a person, like being kind to you know, the people you meet on the street, to your, you know, to your Uber driver, to the people at the grocery stores, just think about what kind of hardships are they going through? Um, you know, I have the luxury of being working from home but a lot of people who are delivering our packages, who are working in the factories, they do not have um, those options. Mm -hmm. So keep this momentum going, uh, both as from a diversity perspective within the company, in the ERGs, you know, be involved, volunteer for other events in different uh, ERGs in the different parts of the company, and also be just, you know, learn from this experience. Like I'm using this opportunity to teach to my kids, uh, you know, what are the different things uh, and how it's important it is to listen to different viewpoints. And my daughter recently has even started, uh, you know, her like in activism and she's asking a lot of good questions. So we can do a lot of good things as a human being, as a parent, as a person uh, in this world, if we just, uh, you know, be open to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so powerful want to uh, really having conversations with your children and seeing and giving them the space to explore things, not only within their community, but also without their community, because they are the next generation. They're going to ask for things more. They're going to expect leaders to be accountable. And that's exactly what we want from them, but exposing them to all those uh, opportunities for to see differences is really, really important. So Segwaying into our, our final question, Craig, I'd like to ask you, what's one call to action you would like to share with our audience today? Good question. Um, I think the, the key for me is just be involved, participate. I mean, I, I think there a lot, a lot of people have a lot to say, right? You provide a point of view. But it's the same thing as voting. If you didn't vote, well, you can't be mad. You can't be mad at the results. So, mm -hmm. so I think that that it's it's a time where there's a huge opportunity for us to make an impact, be involved, be present, be bold, and to continually shape your organization to where I believe most organizations want to go. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that by just sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So. Spend your time. Excellent. Monica, what's one call to action you would like to share? Um, maybe I'll double down on the one that I just kind of mentioned is I would love to see um, more executive sponsorship for key issues um, that are relevant to uh, organizations, ERGs, uh, particularly the underrepresented ones. Um, and just really making sure your data um, that your data is transparent internally and externally, and that you're, you're setting progressive goals for that data um, based on that data. And if you're, if you're not hitting it, you know, be transparent about that. But I'd say just keep going and don't take your foot off the gas. Don't stop talking about it when 2021 or 20, you know, the topic isn't trending on Twitter anymore. Mm -hmm. um, just make sure you're consistently looking around the room and looking at your data at your organization for the representation of your employees 
um, and making sure that, that that data reflects the societies that we live in and that we serve. Manto, you have an, a call to action you would like to share? Yeah, my call to action is, um, you know, question things. Uh, don't be afraid to question. So all of us have stereotypes and biases. That's just part of being human. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you hear something, um, you know, uh, try to look deep down into it. So one example is that, uh, you know, one of the stereotypes is that, oh, Asians are always into computers and because they're shown in media as geeky and nerdy. Um, but the reality is that um, a lot of uh, Asian Americans, uh, they are not well represented at senior and executive positions. Uh, they face the same challenges um, as other minorities. So uh, when we hear stereotypes uh, that we either see in media or we see or we hear, uh, it's important to dig a little bit deeper um, and that can help us identify our own biases. And uh, it can, again, have really impact, a really powerful impact on the ERG work that we are doing. Because when we do uh, this meaningful, uh, you know, ERG work with diversity and inclusion, um, we want to make sure that um, all of us have really good intentions, but we also want to make sure that we are uh, really breaking down on breaking down on those stereotypes and biases, and uh, um, you know, uh, by questioning everything, we can start to move more into intersectionality initiatives that I've talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with you, and I would just what add one more thing to everything that you all have said. And, and that is the power of just being educated. Get educated. As you mentioned, as you mentioned um, before, Manta, ask the questions, but also read. Educate yourself before you go in and ask the questions. So at least when you ask the questions, you have some basis as to where your, your, your questions are coming from and some knowledge around uh, the, the differences. And um, there's so many things, so many valuable resources that are out there that are available but really take the time to, to get educated on the different cultures and the differences that each of us may be experiences, experiencing because we are different. Any final thoughts? Anyone would like to share? No. Um, well, I would like to say that, you know, what Craig mentioned, I think there is, uh, we can all learn from each other. So first of all, thank you for the space to have this conversation. Um, and thank you, Monica and Craig. I learned a lot from you. Um, and I hope conversations like this can continue um, and be shared so that, you know, we can continue on this journey and we can um, keep the momentum going. Absolutely agree. Thank you. So thank you everyone for sharing your viewpoints with me today and with our audience. Really, really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure sitting here and chatting with you. I too have learned a lot from all of you and um, look forward to hopefully spending more time and having more conversations like, with, like this in the near future. Um, and please be sure to join us again for our next episode on uh, ha hashtag Workday Chats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.